Thank you, Christopher. And moving to our final round of paper speakers this evening. Speaking third in proposition of the moment is what motion, there we go, is Lord MacDonald. Lord MacDonald is a former diplomat who was the permanent undersecretary at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and head of the diplomatic service until late 2020 and the current master of Christ College. Thank you for joining us tonight, Lord MacDonald. You have the floor. Thank you, thank you very much. It has been, if I may say, an absolutely fascinating debate. I've been watching the number of hands going up as volunteers to, to speak for each side. I've noted many more hands going up to oppose the motion than to propose. So I identify uh, a sticky wicket. But I think it's possible to make complementary, different cases from the proposer and the seconder, complementary uh, case for you to consider voting in favour of this motion. And I have five points that I want you, please, uh, to ponder. Um, the first, very, very basic, is that China is clearly not a perfect country. We've had many powerful uh, speeches this evening, but for me, the most powerful was from Rahima. Uh, clearly, from her perspective, there is a huge problem for China. But I am not going to argue from the point of a Uyghur. I am going to argue from the point of the United Kingdom. And I'm going to treat the we in the motion as we, the United Kingdom. No. Um, <laughs> so, China is not perfect, but neither are we. On that point. On that point, who's that? <laughs> um, I don't really see how it's from a reader perspective or from any perspective. China is objectively uh, supporting genocide, is objectively opposing uh, democracy and liberalism across the world. You're taking too long to, your, too, too long to make your point, and I will respond to the point you've made already. Um, I, I have no, no sympathy at all with Chinese policies in uh, Xinjiang. I have no sympathy for Chinese policies in Tibet, but that is not the nub of my argument this evening. But to complete my first point, we in the United Kingdom are not perfect. Clearly, we can have this debate. It's been a really good debate. It's been a really open debate. But the idea that we're talking in a perfect democracy, which I think was a point almost made by Sammy, is just ludicrous. Um, we are in a country which has a first-past-the-post voting system. I think by any measure, this time you can go. Isn't it just insulting to two people who've had their lives threatened by the Chinese Not at all. I've applauded them. The I've applauded them. I am arguing from a different point of view. So we of the United Kingdom are not perfect. That is my first point. The second. So um, this is a very polarized debate. I think lots of the contributions this evening have demonstrated that people feel passionately on one side or another side. And we've seen this reflected in the politics of the United Kingdom. Uh, remember, and we've been reminded this evening, that in the last decade we had the golden era. We had Cameron Osborne arguing persistently that China was the best option for the UK as it made its way in the world in the middle of the 21st century. Then we had a change of government, and Theresa May flipped this argument completely. And so for five years, we have been really focused on the threat from China. So we in the United Kingdom have completely remade our policies in the last five years. Over there. But surely that's because China has also um, flipped their foreign policy, so that we changed our foreign policy to tackle their foreign policy. I disagree with that. I think that the driver in the United Kingdom was the arrival of Theresa May, who had a very much more pronounced interest in security concerns, which were not the priority of Cameron and Osborne. So I think this was an internally driven flip. But I think we have the opportunity in this chamber to sort of thread our way through. We do not need to embrace one extreme or the other. I am inviting us to look at this proposition from the point of view of the United Kingdom. Over here. Um, as, quite, uh, as we've spoken about quite often, it's very much China's right to be seen as either a winner or a loser or an enemy or a friend. 
Um, it's very um, two-dimensional argument, and that's why the book Orientalism it speaks about it a lot. Um, don't you think, um, especially someone who's worked in the government sector, that China or, or the UK's perspective should have a more nuanced um, uh, method of tackling China and also can I just say, yes, I agree with you. So we should be more nuanced. Also, don't we think that instead of also fearing China, we should fear the fact that we don't know much about China. If you ask someone in the um, general public of England, their knowledge is very nuanced. We'll see what's on TV. I would say their knowledge is very limited. But you're absolutely building a bridge to my third point, which is this idea of fear. So I've just done one, so no. Um, uh, this idea of fear. So what are we afraid of as we look at China? What potentially are we afraid of? And one of the things in this hall which we might be afraid of is that our time writing the rule book of the international community is kind of over. And there is sort of regret that that is happening, even though it is absolutely justified that this time is over. So we will not be calling the shots. The United Kingdom is not going to be calling the shots in the international community in the next period. And so part of the fear is that China is looking more powerful than we are. And there is this idea that what displaces us is different from us, is perhaps worse from us, isn't going to be as good from the point, our point of view as when we were calling the shots. Well, I think we just have to acknowledge this as a fact. China, in the middle of the 21st century, is going to be more powerful than the United Kingdom. And this is just a fact of life. Over here. Well, I think the fear comes from the fact that it's not just that we're losing power. It's that the country that is gaining power is committing acts of genocide and not defending. Right. So I... I completely acknowledge this as a fear, but I think that this is the basis of our engagement with China. I'm not advocating that we roll over and accept whatever is happening in China. It, no, you've already had a go. Uh, so we need to have a grown-up relationship with China, which encompasses all aspects of a very difficult relationship with some very difficult subjects to discuss. But I don't think we should resile from that, and I don't think we should be afraid of that. I think I'll go over there. Thank you so much. Don't you think, though, that fear is a tale of simplistic spot? Don't you think fear can kind of be the spur that criticizes our intent to really work with the other countries in Europe and maybe across the Atlantic that share our values to kind of counter some of that? Don't you think? I disagree with you on the way that fear operates. I think fear paralyzes. I think fear reduces your options. I think what you're talking about is a cold eyed assessment of your interests and how you pursue those interests. And I agree with that, but I don't think that springs from fear. So, the third point. We not need to look at this idea of fear. What are we afraid of? And how legitimate is that fear? Okay. We are afraid of a country that's committing mass genocide and has been dishonest about a virus that has the whole world on lockdown. This, I could see the little hisses. These are some disputed facts. But what I'm proposing... No, no, it is, there are disputed facts. These are disputed facts. Several people have talked about information bubbles. They are absolutely existent in China, but so are they in the United Kingdom. The prevalence, the preference of British people now to seek news where they're comfortable with the views they read is something we should also bear in mind as we look at ourselves. So, no. Point number four I'm getting to. Uh, this is the briefest point. This is the stuff that hasn't been mentioned so far, that China has contributed positively to the wider international community. So it hasn't been mentioned by my previous and my colleagues, and it's about um, economic growth. China has contributed economic growth in the 2000 decade, 2000 to 2015, the only source of economic growth in the world from which the rest of the world benefited. Last point, I'm in the last minutes. The last point is there is nothing, but nothing in the world that matters in the next period.
that we can deal with without China. Whether we're talking the environment, whether we're talking counter-terrorism, whether we're talking AI, we need a relationship with China. And fear is the very worst basis for that essential relationship. Thank you very much.